from the Lord that we pray that will continue to keep us lifted up and encouraged on this journey for the Lord. Today we want to share with you from the New Testament, from the first epistle of Peter, Peter's first letter uh, to the church, uh, chapter 5, if you will, 1 Peter chapter 5, that we might share a word with you as we continue in this celebration of what the Lord is doing, has done in the lives of the people here in Red Oak, North Carolina for the last 150 years. From 1 Peter chapter 5, we want to read from these two verses that says in chapter, in chapter 5, uh, verse 10, Peter says, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I want to talk today, as we have been talking throughout this month, uh, from the thought of prayer. And I want to talk today from these verses and surrounding verses about the prayer of Peter. The prayer of Peter. On the first Sunday of this month, we started the year off of preaching on prayer as we use the prayer of King Solomon as he dedicated the temple to God and prayed that the temple would be a place that the people could meet with God for their needs. And especially when they sin, that they could meet there with God and find forgiveness for their sins. The second Sunday, we talked about the prayer of King David, the father of Solomon as he asked God to lead him in a plain path. Even though King David had enemies all around him, he still wanted to do the right thing as he represented God. The third Sunday, we talked about one of the prayers of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he prayed for strength to love his enemies. As we talk today, I want to talk about the prayer of Peter uh, you will recall that these are one of the many prayers of Peter and that as we look at the scriptures that oftentimes we read and we reread and we read through, uh, but sometimes we uh, don't recognize that what we are reading are parts of prayers that people are praying for the saints of God. And so today as we talk about this, you will recall that Peter was one of those disciples that Jesus chose from the fishing trade to become a fisher of men. Peter was one of those that often got things wrong. Sometimes, as we say sometimes uh, in our uh, vernacular today, that uh, Peter would have the, uh, his mouth going without his brain being engaged, sometimes seemingly. We remember that as one of his disciples that Peter went to sleep on Jesus at the hour of prayer. When Jesus told his disciples to stay here, to tarry here and watch while I go yonder and pray. When he returned, he found Peter, but not only Peter, but the other disciples sleeping on him. Peter said, Peter said that he would not deny Jesus, but as the trial of Jesus started to progress, Peter denied knowing Jesus. In spite of Peter's shortcomings, Jesus saw something in him that was solid so Jesus called him Peter the Rock. As Peter prays in our text today, he prays because he sees something in the leadership of the church that is worth encouraging. Peter wanted to engage the power of God in the lives of those who were leaders in the church. He wanted them to know that Christian leadership, no matter how small the role, is a privilege that is granted by God. Paul reminds the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 4 and 11 that he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Paul notes that he himself, meaning that God gave different gifts to different people. When we think about our different gifts, we ought to not be envious or jealous of the gifts of others because God is the author of whatever gift it is that we have. God is the author of the gift and the grantor of the gift. So leadership is a privilege that is granted by God. 
And it ought not to be taken lightly because as Ephesians continues in 4 and 12, he says that for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the ministry of the Lord. Peter was a leader of the church of Jerusalem and was one of the most influential leaders of the first century. And he prayed for pastors and leaders around him. Peter had taught the church how to act and what to expect as the believers struggle with persecutions. Sometimes in life, we all struggle with some form of persecution. The persecution is often used by the devil to try to destroy our faith. When I think about, about our founding fathers in days gone by, the founding fathers of this church, uh, this branch of Zion, if you will, and how that just a few years from slavery that the Lord had led them to establish a church in this community. Can you imagine how the devil must have dealt with their faith? Freed from slavery, but no goods to live off of. Freed from slavery, but no land to make a living off of. Freed from slavery, but nowhere to lay their heads, if you will. I, I can imagine that they remembered somewhere along the way in hearing Jesus' words that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Oh, how the Spirit of God must have encouraged them. No wonder they would find somewhere to have a praying ground in the community. They, they use their God-given gifts for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. They prayed one another through, as we say nowadays. We must continue to do the same for ourselves and the generation to come. In this present society, life is becoming more and more difficult. We deal and live in a time when we, uh, some don't know the truth and some don't accept the truth. Some don't want to face the truth and some believe that there is no truth. So we accept the truth of God and as we accept that, then we must learn to pray one another through, if you will. As saints of God, as we believe in the truths of God, then we have to stay on bended knees that we might be able to Pray one another through. Prayer, if you will, engages the mind of God in human affairs. Prayer engages the eyes of God as he watches over us. The scripture teaches us that not one sparrow falls without his knowledge and, and, and we are more valuable than many sparrows. Prayer involves the ears of God as we listen to as he listens to the prayers of his people and, and, and prayer engages the nose of God as he smells the sweet aroma as we praise and worship him. Our prayer, my brothers and sisters, engages the mouth of God as we listen for that still small voice speaking which way we should go, leading us in the plain path, if you will. Prayer as we pray to God our Father calls on the hand of God to, who fashioned us in the vessel of clay that he wants us to be. He, he, the one who fashioned us and gave us the gifts that we are blessed to have, whatever they might be. When the hand of God is called on, he can keep back the enemy. He can move the mountains. He can open the door. He can shut the door. He can bless us and he can keep us so that we don't be afraid to pray for one another through these difficult times. Songwriter that we used to hear from and sing often was don't stop praying for the Lord is nigh. Don't ever stop praying that he'll hear your cry. The Lord has promised and his word is true. Just keep on praying and he will answer you. Peter alerted the church to persecution from within and sometimes without. Because the devil, like a roaring lion, is always seeking for whom he may divide. Peter concludes his first letter by telling the pastors here how they are supposed to act. That they are to serve willingly. As leaders, we are to serve with joy, not begrudging the work that is before us. We are to serve humbly 
as Christ set the example for us. We are encouraged to wrap the apron of humility around us and go on out and serve and serve those on the outside so that they may come on the inside and serve those on the inside so that they may become stronger so that when the chief shepherd appears that they too can receive a crown of righteousness. Our service, my brothers and sisters, is not about us, not about what we will win, but it's about who we reach out to. It's about uh, those that we will help to come into the fold so that they might be a part of the kingdom, that they might be joint heirs uh, with Jesus, our Savior, and with all of us, and that when the Lord calls us, that we can too receive the crown of righteousness. Come, come and listen to me now. Listen with us as as we listen to Peter now, as he starts to engage in prayer uh, from our text for the people. In verse 10, Peter says, But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Peter engages heaven's prayer room by asking for the ear of one who is the author of all grace. He does not call on the God of some grace, but the God of all grace. You know the unmerited favor of God. You don't deserve to be where you are. I don't deserve to be where I am. But because of God's grace, he has called some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Because of God's grace, he has called some to participate in government. He uses some that, that he gave gifts of helping others because of God's grace. He gives some gifts to sing. He gives some gifts to play the instrument. To others, he gives uh, to be the, have the gift of ushering. To some, he gives the gift of missionaries and some deacons, some uh, deaconess, some to be trustees. But in all of these places, his grace has been instituted. It is, and, and we are called on to put on the apron of humility and serve. Listen, if you will, the call to the labor. The ministry before us is a call to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ. We are called into service for the Lord, called to be attached to the vine and bear fruit as we studied recently in our Sunday school lesson. Peter prays for us to be reminded of the grace of God so that when we start to get puffed up, that we will remember that we are made in this and, and, and we are signed in this because of God's grace. When we start getting puffed up, we need to recognize that God could have called somebody else. He could have given somebody else the voice that he gave you. He could have given somebody else the gift of, of singing or the gift of reading or the gift of helping. That he could have given somebody else that gift just as easily as he gave it to you. So before we get puffed up, we must remember that it's by God's grace that we are blessed to be where we are and to have what we have. Peter says to them that after you have suffered a while, he realizes that for the leaders, for the, the Christian that, that suffering will come, but suffering comes with the reason behind it. And uh, let me apologize again to, to those of you that may be in the audience today, those who are listening. Let me apologize again to you that uh, who thought that when you came to Christ that that, that uh, you would come and, and that everything would be fixed, that, that everything would be smooth, that it would be without heartaches and without troubles. Let, let me apologize to those who thought that because you tithe that prosperity would always be on your side. Perhaps we have not plain, made it plain enough over the years and, and, and Peter prays, says that after you have suffered a while, he didn't say that suffering would endure, but after you have suffered a while, he says that these things will happen. Jesus said in John 16 and 33 that we learned from our Sunday school lesson last week that these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus reminds us that we will have trouble in this world, but we can find peace in, in him, if you will. After you have suffered a while, 
Uh, we are going through some things right now. H how much longer will we suffer in this pandemic? How long will people have to suffer in areas where wildfires have destroyed, in other areas where volcanoes have erupted, in areas where earthquakes have shaken down houses and broken up streets? How long will suffering endure where flood waters have washed away houses and lands and automobiles? And, and, and will the people of Ukraine suffer if Russia invades? Will the people of Russia suffer if economic sanctions are enacted upon them? Will America and her allies suffer from Russia's backlash? That, that, that we, we are those in America who claim the name of Jesus continue to have the freedom to worship without fear of persecution. Peter reminds us that suffering is on the agenda. He says that after you have suffered a little while, he says that suffering will occur for a little while. But then he prays that the suffering will have a positive effect on our lives. First of all, he says that his prayer is that the suffering will perfect you. As scholars say that the wording used here actually means mend your necks. We remember from Matthew 4 and 21 that going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them. This was the call of the early disciples to become fishers of men. They were mending their nets. They knew it was not profitable for fishermen to go out fishing with broken nets the fish would be able to escape. Peter prays perhaps that through the suffering, the people would come to realize the call on their lives. As Christians, we need to mend our nets. When the net is broken, the fish can escape. When the net of God's love is broken, people escape back into the world. The church must be a mending place for those who are suffering. No matter which part of the net you try to escape from, that the love of God ought to catch you there. That there ought not to be any breaches in the love of God, in his net of love. That, but wherever people try to backslide, wherever people try to step out, that God's love ought to be able to rescue them. Peter reminds us that suffering would cause them to see the holes in their nets so they would know what needed to be repaired. Uh, you can't fish well, my brothers and sisters, with broken nets. It's just simply not economically pro profitable. And likewise with the church, we can't fish with broken nets. It's not economically or it's not spiritually um, uh, uh, progressive, if you will, for us to fish with broken nets. Secondly, Peter prays and he says, the suffering will establish you. Suffering will bring us to the place of, of finding where we stand, of finding out who we are. In our suffering, we can be bitter about it or we can grow from it. Suffering can push us up or it can pull us down, depending on our choice. In her book, Confessions of the Sharecropper's Daughter, Dr. Pajella McCall talks about those times of being a sharecropper on the farm in the South. How that her father had no education. The owner of the land didn't want them to get an education. They owned no land. Uh, often went without proper food and clothing, but the suffering pushed them forward. They didn't allow it to bring them down. While others were pulling them down, they had a mother who pushed them up. As Peter prayed, it was a push up for his people in his prayers. It was a push up, if you will, for his brothers and sisters instead of, of letting the devil bring them down. The scripture teaches us to pray for uh, all those that are in authority above us. But as we pray, my brothers and sisters, and we are obedient to the scripture, that as a people, we ought to pray for the pushing of Kamala Harris and, and our black leaders because there are still those who judge by the color of our skin rather than content of our character. We ought to pray that even in suffering that it will motivate us to be able to press on in life, that it will push us forward and not pull us back, that it will push us closer to the kingdom of God. 
And thirdly, as Peter prays, he prays for them to be strengthened, if you will. Jesus, if you remember, prayed for Peter because the devil desired to sift him like wheat. The devil desired to bring Peter down, but Jesus wanted to lift him up. Jesus knew that Peter would face hostile powers, so he prayed for him that when he had found strength, that he would strengthen his brother. Sometimes troubles come to make us strong, if you will. God uses our struggles as a witness that what he has done for others, that he can do the same for you. He prays for our stability in the storms of life. The old church would sing the prayer in the song, Lord, don't move my mountain. Just give me strength to climb. Lord, don't move, don't take away my stumbling block, but just give me strength and lead me all around. They sang in their suffering for strength. We must learn, my brothers and sisters, to do the same in this generation in which we live. To ask the Lord that in the mountain times that are before us, that he'll not move the mountain, but give us the strength to be able to climb. That, that he'll not take away that which is a stumbling block in our way. But he will show us that he is God. That he will show up. That he gives us the strength to be able to be led around the stumbling block. Those things that would draw us down. That, that he can lead so that we know that these are things that lift us higher and higher toward heaven's glory. Lastly and fourthly. Peter prays for the Lord to settle them in their suffering. Oh, that, that, that's a, a, a wonderful statement, a powerful statement there that, that as Peter prays that, that, that he wants them to become settled in their suffering. Uh, this, this doesn't mean that they're, they're satisfied with their suffering. That it does not mean that they feel like that they're just stuck here and they're not going anywhere. But, but, but Peter prays for them to become settled in their suffering because it will let them know that, that God is still on the throne, that God is still moving even in the midst of suffering. To say he wants to, it settled in their minds that there is an enemy, but there is also the victory. Peter gives us a glimpse and he gives us a hint that after you have suffered a while, he wanted it settled in their minds and we need to settle it in our minds that suffering won't last, that the enemy won't last, that the enemy will not win. He tells us in his word to put on the whole armor of God so that we can be shielded from the fiery darts of the devil. Anybody today got it settled in your mind, in your heart, like the hymnologist wrote time again or uh, years ago that I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm going, gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Oh, I want to live above the world uh, to uh, though Satan's dots at me are hurled, for faith has caught a joyful sound. The song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. Plant my feet on higher ground. As we depart from one another in this message, I want to encourage us to keep on praying, to keep on lifting others in prayer, to keep on uh, uh, being determined to, to, to be uh, pray prayerful and to pray through, if you will. Uh, be like Jacob to hold on until he blesses you. Whatever you are going through, hold on until he blesses you because the scripture lets us know that he delights in giving us his grace. He resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. He gets joy in lifting you. Therefore, the word says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. It's all right, my brothers and sisters, to be of the ladder. But we ought not to try to get up the ladder before it's time to get up the ladder, if you will. And so the Lord says that if we'll humble ourselves in the sight of him, that he will exalt us in due time. When God exalts us, then we can stay where we are. When God exalts us, nobody can bring us down. When God exalts us, he continues to get the glory. When God exalts us, it settles things in our minds. It, it helps us to mend our nets. It gives us strength. When God exalts us, when he raises us up, as we lift him up, my brothers and sisters, then, then he has promised that he will draw all men unto himself. When Peter finished praying, he lifted God in the doxology of praise. 
as he said to him, be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Oh, my brothers and sisters, as we think about Peter's prayer, that, that there are things that we can copy in our lives, that we can remember that in everything, in all situations, that we can keep on finding strength through him to be able to give God the glory and to recognize that his is the dominion, that his is the power forever and ever. Troubles may come. We may suffer for a little while, my brothers and sisters. Things may not be like we want it to be. But we have a God who declares to us that he has dominion over everything. His son, when he got up on the third day morning, declared that all power in heaven and in earth was in his hand. And so, my brothers and sisters, nothing has changed. That that power still belongs to him. His is the glory. His is the dominion. His is the power. His is the glory. Keep on praying. Let the troubles push you forward. Don't let them pull you down. Keep pushing ahead. Keep pressing on that you might win the fight and that you might be victorious in Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we pray now that your word would not go out and come back void. But again, that it would accomplish that which you desire. That as you speak to the hearts of people today, pray that you speak to that soul that is near as hell. That soul that has never confessed you as Lord and Savior. We don't know how long life will last. But we know that today, as you've declared in your word, is the day of salvation. Pray that you reach some soul through your word, through your spirit, that would confess you as Lord and Savior, receive you into their lives as their Lord, believing that you are the Son of God, believing that God has raised you from the dead, believing that you have the power of salvation, that, that the plan of salvation is finished in and through you. Thank you now for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now unto 